primary differentiators between professional golfers and recreational golfers is indeed physical skill. Now, the difference between really good pro players and just okay professional players is psychological. Not always, but primarily. So the difference in skill between a professional golfer and your average recreational golfer is leaps and bounds. You could be the most confident and the most present recreational golfer and at a 10 handicap, you're gonna get killed by a professional player, even if that professional player is playing through anxiety. Like the skill difference is too high. I don't wanna pretend that our psychology is the only thing that's important in our performance. It is not, skill matters. But what access we have to that skill depends on how stable our confidence is. And so if you think about anxiety, it's a reflection of really unstable confidence, which basically means you're more preoccupied with trying to avoid a future you don't want than you are pursuing the task at hand in the present moment. Hi, this is Tony Redden from Cincinnati, Ohio, and I play golf at Newman Golf Course. This is Golf Smarter number 895. Golf Beneath the Surface, the new science of golf psychology with author Raymond Pryor. This is Golf Smarter, sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome to the Golf Smarter podcast, Raymond. Thank you very much, Fred. Good to be here. It's great to have you on. I'm fascinated about this book. It's intense. I have to tell you, this book is intense, but I learned so much. When you say intense, what do you mean by that? Um, Sometimes it felt clinical, sometimes it felt academic, and then sometimes it was chatty. Um, So I really uh, was enjoying it. I was enjoying it, but I find that I would spend more time reading because I was reading slowly and reading things over like, wait, let me absorb that a little bit more. Um, But uh, you got me on the title alone, Golf Beneath the Surface, The New Science of Golf Psychology, which I thought was a great title. Um, And also a practical guide to composure under pressure, long-term growth, and more fulfilling relationship with the game. What brought you to write this book? Well, probably the exact reason that your experience was in that a couple of people have told me like, okay, this is a little bit of a different read for the, for the performance psychology part of golf. And it's going to yeah. take, and, and reading the book is a little bit more comprehensive, no doubt. And there is some academic information in it. There's also some, I discussed pretty significantly the type of stuff um, that we as humans take personally about golf that keeps us from being as confident as we would like to be and keeping the game from being as enjoyable. And I talk about them at a mechanistic level, meaning at the deepest level that we understand thus far. The reason it's been a bit of a read for people where they might have to go back and really soak things in is because most golfers don't have a very good understanding about their psychology based on what's been currently available in golf. Mm. And quite frankly, the book is a bit of a challenge to the status quo of what's been available for a long time, which has been helpful to a lot of people. I don't want to uh, discount any of that. The psychology in golf has been due for an upgrade for quite a while. Um, And there's never been more science and never been a deeper understanding of human psychology, particularly as it relates to performance. And my hope is that this book provides a um, an upgrade to golfers looking for it. Like every area of golf is jumping by leaps and bounds because of the science behind it and the research being done, whether that's club technology, golf ball technology, course management. the psychology of the game has been lagging behind for a long time. So the fact that this book is something that people have to absorb a little bit more than previous resources, I think is a little bit more of an understanding that people don't understand it very deeply. My hope is that that book, this book will give them that information. Um, and so that they can kind of be a bit of an expert on their own psychology rather than outsourcing it to someone at like kind of more of a surface level. Well, you know, here you are on golf smarter. And the premise of this show has always been about you can you can basically you can uh, improve your game faster by working on your mental game and your mental approach to the game than you can if you just work on your swing mechanics. And I've gotten lots of confirmation about that over the years. But when um, when you say it's needed an upgrade, when do you feel that golf, the mental game of golf or golf psychology, got stagnant? 
Um, difficult to say, probably before we realized it does. And that is because it takes a little while, you know, for really good research to be done in any field, but particularly psychology, like you're talking about a multi-year, multi-phase process of kind of exploratory research, moving into more experimental research into longitudinal research. And so the stagnation and kind of the lag behind has probably been happening for a couple of decades, uh, best guess. Um, and much of the stuff that has been available for a while, and this is certainly true even before I got to graduate school and was studying it, was stuff that was kind of commonly accepted as kind of best practices at the time. But they, we know now that we're working, those were working from some outdated models and that there's more valuable stuff uh, to us if we understand them a little bit more comprehensively in the same way. You know, what is the, like, how long has course strategy been lagging behind before someone like a Scott Fawcett comes around and starts doing some advanced math on it and starts figuring out like actually this is the best way to play golf courses these are the types of things that really do matter you know, I had a conversation with um, Lou Stagner last week and he was talking about like how on TV you he often hear something like well you need to be in this part of the fairway to have a good angle to a flag or a good approach to the flag turns out statistically speaking not true at all farther down the fairway the better basically period, end of sentence. And just being in the fairway is plenty good enough. Now, are you splitting hairs? Sure, depending on if you're playing Augusta National and you're going to have to hit something into a tucked pin. But for the most part, just being in the fairway is priority number one and what side of it on you're on matters far less than we thought it does. In the same way that a lot of the psychological models we're working from, like just trust and just don't think and you got to just relax, are all outdated things that seemed really valuable at the time. But if we take a deeper look at them in a more objective way, we find out they actually do more harm than good. You know, we're talking primarily here, this, the audience, are recreational golfers, amateur golfers, they're just happy yeah. to be in the fairway. Sure. Forget about which side it is. You know, yeah, exactly. I play with guys who regularly, if the ball hits the green, they're like, great shot, you know, yep. but they're only 80 yards out, you know, where, where on the tour level, these guys are throwing dimes at the pin. Um, and if Most they're of the outside time. of five feet, they're upset. Yeah, I will tell you this, though. If you told a PJ Tour player, you're just going to be in the fairway all the time and what side of the fairway could be either one, they'll take that every time. I promise you that. <laughs> yes, they would. So what brought you to... Um, to this point where you're able to write a book. Are you a PhD? Are you MD? Tell me your history. Yeah, so my by training and trade, I'm a performance consultant. My areas of expertise are performance psychology, performance neuroscience, and sleep science. I have a doctorate in performance psychology, a bunch of different master's degrees in related fields like sports sciences and counseling, a couple of undergrad degrees. So I am abundantly educated um, and then spend a lot of my time researching and trying to understand most fields, particularly brain related to performance. Um, and I got to it being curious about what it is that keeps people from really getting better and performing under pressure. And as we find out the first domino in the order of operations to allow us to physically perform is always our psychology. You know, you had mentioned, you know, people telling you, well, I get better focusing on my psychology of how I'm playing more than just beating balls and physic trying to physically practice. You know, the gateway to getting better physically begins psychologically. So for me, I just wanted to go to the front of the line so that all the things people do to try to perform better, whether that's their rest and recovery, their nutrition, the physical training they're doing for their bodies, strength and conditioning, all the way to actually learning the skills and strategies of a course, they have more access to those because their psychology is not the main barrier to it. So in a nutshell, that's kind of my job is to help people understand their psychology so that it opens the doors to all those other things. And people have asked me like, how, what percent of golf is mental? Is it 99% mental? 1% like, I don't know what the percent is. I think it would be kind of impossible to tell. All I can tell you is whatever percent it is, it's what is influencing every single other facet of the game more than any others. And so if you take care of whether it's 1% or 99%, if you're training that 1%, you're getting more out of every other area. And I wouldn't pretend that psychology is everything in our performance because it's not. But like I said, it's the first domino in the order of operations. And we, if we take care of that one, the rest of them tend to get better. And how do we take care of it? 
Well, first is to understand it, which again is part of why I wrote the book, you know, even talking with tour professionals, just because they are the ones performing under pressure, like it's a, it would be a misconception to think that they know deeply about their own psychology or how their psychology works, or even how their brain is designed to operate. Many of them don't. And why would they? They've been playing golf their whole life and training their golf swings and their putting strokes the whole time, right? So the bottom line is, do you even understand how your brain is operate operates and how it's designed to learn, how it's designed to respond to stress, to uncertainty, those types of triggers in all of our performance environments? And then can you also understand how do I train and articulate the types of things that allow me to be present more often, build more stable confidence and be aware of my own responses to things. It's there are systematic approaches to all of them, but it's for certainly begins with just understanding your brain and your mind on a more mechanistic level on how it's designed to operate in the same way that the tour pros are really good at hitting golf balls because they're hitting golf balls based on how the club is designed. So imagine if you don't understand how a golf club is designed, it would be a lot more difficult to hit a golf ball well. Same thing with our brain. If you don't know how it's designed to operate, it's very difficult to deliver it to the things in the same way it'd be more difficult to deliver the golf face to the golf ball if you don't understand how a golf club is designed to get the golf ball in the air. Hmm. I find it fascinating that you are a PhD and yet you don't put doctor or PhD on the cover of your book. That's usually a selling point, isn't it? Um, I think sometimes I don't feel the need to flaunt credentials in people's faces or to try to loom it and use it as a marketing campaign. My name's on the book because I wrote it. I want it to be something that when someone walks by it, they might go, hmm, that's interesting. I'll pick it up because I'm interested in golf. I'm interested in understanding myself better and perhaps playing better, not because there's some letters after some guy's name. Now, if that's a selling point for some people because it adds credibility to me, open the first page, you'll see PhD after my name, fine. But I don't, my ego is strong enough that I don't need it to be on the first page as a, as a means to try to rope people in. Awesome. Yeah. Listen, we're going to uh, be right back, but we have some sponsors who want to talk about why they're part of the Golf Smarter Podcast. We'll be right back. Raymond, I'm curious to talk about the myths of golf psychology and um, golf's mental game uh, that have kind of permeated the, the conversation. And you're finding to not be not only not true, but maybe not even helpful. Correct. Yeah, so here's you're kind of alluding to what we had discussed before, which is perhaps in the past we've been working on a couple of outdated models that um, we're actually finding are more harmful than helpful and not just neutral, but perhaps harmful. You know, in in the book, I uh, dispel probably five or six different myths that are pretty common uh, practices, not just in golf, but in performance psychology in general that we're finding out that don't really work very well and tend to proliferate the types of struggles that we create for ourselves. You know, in the first uh, section of the book, I address the myth that a little bit of anxiety is a good thing. This is something you hear in golf all the time. And the bottom line is our research tells us the exact opposite. Now, it is perfectly normal for us as human beings to feel anxiety at times. Anxiety, by definition, is worry about the future. It's not the same as feeling nervous. Nervous is our physiological response to when things are important to us and they're actually happening in real time and results count. Anxiety is different. Anxiety is worrying about a future that doesn't necessarily exist yet. And that worry creates multitasking between the present moment and the future, which disrupts physical skills. And not only that, it makes the experience less enjoyable. Um, When we are off time, off time meaning dwelling on the past or projecting the future, um, it's a low dopaminergic experience to that. And by that, I mean, it means low dopamine. Low dopamine is another way of saying it doesn't feel very good for us. It's not very motivating and it makes the experience feel longer. So dopamine plays a massive role in how enjoyable things feel to us, even when they're difficult and uh, uncertain and really challenging and perhaps include some adversity. And dopamine also plays a significant role in how we experience the passage of time. Low dopamine experiences feel like they take forever, which is why if you play golf through anxiety or frustration or you're just multitasking with timeframes that don't exist, 
a, a round of golf feels a whole lot longer and is far less enjoyable than it is if you're present more often. The bottom line is we have decades of research that show us that the more present we are in the things that are important to us, the more enjoyable they become, the better we are at dealing with the challenges within them. And ultimately we're higher functioning human beings in them as well. So, um, if we're really talking about what our psychology is gearing us toward us, does it allow you access to being present at the times in our lives when it's most beneficial for us? Indeed. So what separates, I don't want to say tour players, let's say elite players um, from the recreational player as far as anxiety or nerves? Yeah, nothing really. Uh, really? the, the primary different differentiators between professional golfers and recreational golfers is indeed physical skill. Now the difference between really good pro players and just okay professional players is psychological, uh, not always, but primarily, right? So the difference in skill between a professional golfer and your average recreational golfer is leaps and bounds. You could be the most confident and the most present recreational golfer. And at a 10 handicap, you're going to get killed by a professional player, even if that professional player is playing through anxiety, like the skill difference is too high. So again, I don't want to pretend that our psychology is the only thing that's important in our performance. It is not skill matters, but what access we have to that skill depends on how stable our confidence is. And so if you think about anxiety, it's a reflection of really unstable confidence, which basically means you're more preoccupied with trying to avoid a future you don't want than you are pursuing the task at hand in the present moment. Do not make the misconception that all professional golfers are super confident all the time and their confidence is stable. Most of them don't. Most of them, in fact, I would say, have really unstable confidence where they are because they were so good so early. They could rely on the fact that they were just getting results really fast and, um, in the ways that they wanted to for so long that their confidence has been built on that for so long that once that doesn't become that the skill doesn't become the differentiator now you have to generate stable confidence in a self-driven way not an outcome driven way and so if you move up the learning curve in any craft the more you move to the top of the learning curve where it takes longer and more effort to make smaller and smaller increments of progress and the skill differentiator and the, and the strategic differentiators between people get smaller and smaller and smaller, psychology plays a much more influential role. And if you cannot generate stable confidence on your own, you're not going to get the results fast enough to be able to maintain that confidence, which is why they get in these kind of trap loops. I'm amateurs as well, but pros to the same degree. I have to hit a good shot to be confident enough to hit a good shot is a super unstable formula for creating confidence because past events do not actually predict future events and your brain knows that. So what it does is it creates a ton of self-induced pressure to produce an outcome right now, which makes you less likely to be able to perform it efficiently. And then when you don't get it, you put even more pressure on yourself to do it again. And this loop goes around and around and around and gets tighter and tighter and tighter. On the other hand, stable confidence is I'm going to execute this shot. I'm going to see where it goes without needing it to determine my emotional or psychological state in any way. And then you've essentially stopped outsourcing your confidence to outcomes. And the players that figure that out sooner play more consistently. They play more, they play better under pressure and oftentimes separate themselves. Like seeing the best players in the world and the highest rankings competing in the top 20 and competing in majors every week is not just because they're more skilled than the golfers around them. In fact, some of them aren't but their psychology allows them to perform freely when it matters most to them, which is why they're in the in contention week in and week out. Mm. I don't know if you're familiar with the program that was on Netflix, I'm pretty sure, uh, that went inside the PGA Tour and yep. just selected different players. And uh, talk about a guy with all the skills in the world who was attacked by, he, clearly, it was like the first time he had ever I'm talking about Brooks Kepka. It seemed like it was the first time he'd ever been presented with worrying about his psychology. And yeah. it, it really uh, debilitated him. It can be a, a real blow. Now, I'm not going to guess at Brooks' psychology specifically because I think that's just reckless and unethical and rude. But if you're talking about any athlete who has I'll just been... <laughs> sure. If you're talking about somebody who has just been riding immense and very quick and 
early success to confidence, and then you remove that, which part of it is he's injured and his body not doing what he wants to yet after having a pretty significant knee surgery, and then having to work back from that, it is a tremendous blow. And you'll see this in sports or performance anywhere where you go, here's the thing that your confidence is built on, but because it's external and not internally driven, when you remove it, now you're in trouble. And you've either got to learn to build it internally, which is difficult to do when you've never had to do that your whole life, but the far more sustainable method, or you do what many of them do, which is you start chasing outcomes again. And then that becomes a really slippery slope because you start cutting corners. You start looking for quick and easy fixes and hacks and you become highly impatient and it's super frustrating. And ultimately it can be, um, that trap loop all over again. It's just for the first time for many people, that's where the trap loop starts to get exposed for them. And so at those points where the outcomes are not creating confidence for us, our psychological framework gets exposed a little bit. And, you know, for Brooks, it was in a more public way because he's on a Netflix show, but that is an incredibly common experience. I imagine there were many people watching that being able to relate to it. Relate to it. I was cheering it. It was like, yeah. oh my God, it's not just us. Yeah. Yay! I mean, like I said, I wouldn't fall for the misconception that tour players have stable confidence all the time. They are incredibly skilled, but they have the same struggles in terms of their psychology that we do when again, we don't understand it very well. We don't understand what we've built our confidence on before and why that's not work anymore or what to move toward that is a more sustainable model for us. It happens to performers at the top levels in every performance realm. Yeah, I guess it does. Um, you watch that show? I've seen a couple episodes, yeah. Yeah, and did you feel that they were misrepresenting him or maybe in fact going someplace they shouldn't with him? You know, I, I've only professionally met, speaking. Yeah, I've only met Brooks in passing. I, I, I wouldn't even say we really know each other at all. So I can't say how accurate that is for him. Um, I think there's some of that show that is um, extra because it's a show and they want to make it really exciting it's and TV. make it really yeah. and make it really dramatic. I do think it's a, a good window into the tour lifestyle for some people. I would be hesitant to make sweeping conclusions about anything I see in a six episode or seven episode uh, Netflix series for sure. It's, <laughs> it's somewhat representative, but I wouldn't say it's the whole picture by any means. Of course not. Of course not. But we want to believe it is. All right. Another sponsor yeah, yeah. wants to talk to us. We'll be right back. For those who are not watching the video, but can listen to this they they can't tell that above your right shoulder on the wall in the office that you're in there's a flag from augusta national from the masters so i'm assuming you've been there before um do you have uh did you go there as a um for work or did you go there to enjoy golf or both of course well both um but for work i mean i've been there the last couple of Oh, about the last decade or so for work, working with players who have been competing. I've also been as a fan, thankfully. Uh, one year I did get to go with my father and we just enjoyed the experience kind of as a uh, father and son, which is which is for anybody who's done that with their dad or their son knows it's, it's a pretty special experience, especially if you both really like golf. So yeah, I've been, uh, been in and around Augusta quite a bit. Actually, my wife and I used to live in Augusta for a year oh. or so while she was finishing up her postdoc for her work. So it's an area that we are acquainted with, a couple of restaurants that I'm still very fond of. So I always enjoy the experience <laughs> going back every year. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, well, I'm not going to ask you who your clients have been, um, but when you're out there and you're watching at the highest level, it really is the highest level of the game, uh, and you're watching one of your clients, can you tell what's going on in their head and know when they're um, they're in a downward spiral or even if they've, they're totally locked in. Sure. Um, it depends. So I think a, a really common misconception is that because you're have some knowledge of psychology, it makes you a mind reader. It doesn't. My, cl <laughs> my clients know that I'm going to ask them a lot of questions to them. Some of those questions might seem obvious, but I'm not very good at my job when I'm guessing. 
Now, having okay. said that, if I know a client well enough and the types of things that are within their psychological framework and their habitual response pattern, when you know that about somebody, things can be somewhat more predictable because you understand the mechanisms and that person underneath. Um, so if, for example, uh, someone was getting off the rails a little bit, not only would their performance probably tell me, but I would probably have an idea of that was something that uh, was on their radar or perhaps wasn't and we didn't address well enough. And when somebody's locked in, I mean, it doesn't take a psychologist to figure out when somebody's locked in, right? And now locked in just means you're present and you're single tasking on the only thing that is required of you, which is whatever's right in front of you, shot in front of you, walking to your next ball, whatever it might be. Uh, it doesn't take someone to figure out that too soon. Now, having said that, I don't guess with my clients. So if I go, oh, wow, it looks like they're dialed in and I ask about it, sometimes the answer is, no, I wasn't really dialed in. I was just trying to figure out how to keep things on the rails. And other times mm -hmm. when players, go, when I go, hey, man, it looked like things were starting to get off the rails and they go, no, I had it under control, just had a terrible eye here. I was in a divot here or we had the wrong club here or the wind kicked up here. Like there are a variety of different factors. So again, like I said, our psychology is one of the most important, if not the most important, but it's not the only one. And so I try not to guess even when I'm watching clients um, directly. Um, I just, I don't think that ever really gives us the full picture for a human being and takes in enough um considers enough variables to have a full picture about what's going on. Like some of the strongest mental performances many of my clients had, like they're scrapping around trying to figure out how to shoot a 75 and make the cut and they couldn't be happier with their psychology. But the way things were going for them that day, they had to figure it out. Had other players win a golf tournament and go, I left five strokes out there, not necessarily in one round, but over a couple of rounds because I either just wasn't on time and on target. On time and on target is a phrase I use with my clients, meaning I'm present and I'm on target, me on the task involved, which is to get this ball to my target. You know, I hit four or five shots today, not on time and on target, and I just kind of got away with them or didn't. Uh, and so it would, again, I, I wouldn't make a conclusion about a short, a long-term conclusion from a short-term event during anyone's round of golf. Are you a good reader of body language? Or do you not let that dictate anything yeah, either? Body language is more of a symptom than a cause. So as much as people, mm -hmm. certainly body language does matter and it does give us some indication. Oftentimes it's easy to fake body language. You could be an absolute mess mm -hmm. internally and still walking around, you know, with quote unquote good body language. I'm not much concerned with people's body language. It's much more of a symptom than a cause and it's easy to fake. And I'm not interested in fake anything in terms of our performance because that is a super unstable foundation to build anything on. So I might say, hey, I noticed your body language like was this at this point. Tell me about it, whether it was quote unquote good body language or bad body language. But I'm much more un interested in what's going on underneath rather than what's on the surface. Interesting. Um, when you watch golf on TV and you hear uh, these pop psychology, <laughs> you're rolling your eyes. I just bring it up and you're already rolling your eyes. Wait, wait, you know, you hear these, I don't even want to call them pop psychologists, but you know, they've got to make it TV. So they're saying, no. oh, well, his mind is not in it today. Or does, do you just start yelling at the television? No, I've long since let go of the need for commentators to be experts in psychology. That's not their job. <laughs> um, you're, you're, they're doing the best they can with what they know. Um, yeah. Some of them think they know more than they do and they don't. And of course, they need to fill airtime. So they're, they're saying a lot of things to try to fill airspace. I would say there are a couple of people on TV who are pretty good and have a pretty clear idea. Like they've obviously done some inner work at some point or been around somebody who has. There are some that are just wildly incorrect with everything. Um, and there are a couple of people who I actually really like the way they, um, they tee things up psychologically, which they go, you know, in this situation, it's really easy to fall into this type of thinking or it's easy to respond to this without suggesting that a player is or isn't doing that, which again, I think mm. guessing at somebody's psychology, particularly in real time is pretty reckless and kind of disrespectful. If you're feeling airtime, sometimes you got to do that, but guessing at what somebody's thinking and feeling when using body language or outcomes of our performance is a wildly unpredictive method for doing so. And do you find that the comments that you are impressed with uh, usually come from former players? 
Uh, not necessarily. Okay. Not necessarily. I think okay. some former players had a psychological approach that they went from, and the way they talk about it, they're assuming that it applies to everyone, which isn't necessarily yeah. true. And it also, for people who are psychologically trained, would indicate, I don't, you're, when you hear people talking to everybody, you understand like this person doesn't really know what they're talking about. They understand mm -hmm. their own experience with this, but the way they're talking about it is incorrect. Um, so, for people watching golf on TV and when they talk about things psychologically, by the way, swing coaches have told me the same thing when they hear commentators talking about, oh, he did this with the ball and that's why it went that way. And they're like, no, that's not what happened, actually. Uh, <laughs> same thing with the psychology. I would just take everything with a grain of salt. Um, you know, not that they're incorrect all the time, not that they're correct all the time either, but I would take everything with a grain of salt. You know, if you hear somebody saying you just got to get comfortable being uncomfortable, like wildly incorrect. You got to relax in these situations and just banish your thoughts and just don't think about anything. Also, wildly incorrect. Um, but when you hear someone saying, hey, this is a situation where it's really easy to get ahead of yourself or to start focusing on where you don't want the golf ball to go rather than where you do, like that's some really valuable insight without actually guessing what people are saying or, or again, working from stuff that we know doesn't work anymore. Fascinating. Fascinating. Um, is your book, uh, Golf Beneath the Surface, The New Science of Golf Psychology by Raymond Pryor, um, available now wherever you buy your favorite books? Is an audio book available as well? Um, an audio book will be available soon. So I'm happy to say that uh, Tuesday was the release date. So that would be it'd been May 9th for whenever this podcast hits. Uh, <laughs> Golf Beneath the Surface was the number, the audio book and the ebook were number one and two on new releases in sports psychology. And the book actually cracked into the top selling list, which has been great. Um, uh, congratulations. As, yeah, thank you. And as of this morning, it is currently out of stock on Amazon, but you can get it wherever bookstores are, wherever books are sold and Amazon will restock immediately is what I've been told. So, um, yeah, it's been off to a great that's start. Great. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's fabulous news. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. All right. Let's take a pause right here so that people can make the order right now, and then we'll come back and dig into the book. Yeah, excellent. This week on Golf Smarter Mulligans is part of our continuing tribute to Dr. Glenn Alba, who appeared on Golf Smarter six times, but unfortunately passed away at the age of 91 this past February. In this third episode, originally published as Golf Smarter number 420, we hear part one of two from January 21, 2014, called Practice Like You Play for Better Results on the Course. The next time you go to the range, why don't you do first shot practice? Okay, what's first shot practice? Change targets on every shot. I can use the same club. If you really have some skill, you can change the, the shape of the shot. You can change clubs on each shot, but you can't repeat anything. What you're going to find probably won't practice as well as when you hit 57 irons in a row, but it's going to correlate more significantly to what you do when you play on the course. Maybe the next time you practice, you take the wedge out and get some targets out there at 10-yard intervals, 30, 40, 50, 60 yards. And you'll practice hitting your wedges the correct distances. That's Golf Smarter Mulligans, episode 211, the third of six episodes in our series featuring another incredible mental game coach whom we recently lost but allow his legacy to live on, Dr. Glenn Alba, author, coach, and pioneering sports psychologist. Check the show notes or our blog post to learn more about Glenn, how to get either of his books, Winning the Battle Within and The Clutch Golfer Formula, and information about donations in his memory. Please subscribe for free to both of our golf podcasts, Golf Smarter, published every Tuesday since 2005, and our sister podcast that revisits the best of Golf Smarter that is no longer available. It's called Golf Smarter Mulligans, being released every Friday from wherever you're listening right now. What I found fascinating about the book is um, it seemed to go in and out of, you know, hard psychology to uh, wellness to actually mindfulness, which I thought was really a, an interesting it was interesting to be included in that. Um, let, let's, let's break down the book a little bit. You start with the brain and that's like, Oh, this is getting clinical. This is going to be, I have, I'm going to be challenged. Then all of a sudden we're on awareness and mindfulness. 
um, that flowed seamlessly right into it, which I thought was just really well done. Congratulations. Let's talk about this, why we start with the brain and then end with, with the mindfulness element. Yeah, you start with the brain because if you don't understand how the brain as an organ is designed to work, your psychology is not going to make sense. And why you would train certain things uh, also wouldn't make sense. You know, for example, just telling someone to relax does not make sense when you understand how your brain is designed. Because it's not designed to relax when outcomes matter to us. It's designed to elevate, right? So understanding how your brain works, you don't need to be a neuroscientist, but if you've got a couple of um, mechanistic fundamentals, which I introduce in the first chapter, you're going to start to understand why some of the things you're doing work or don't work. Again, the analogy I'll use is if you don't understand how a golf club is designed to get a golf ball off the air, the physics of your swing are not going to make sense. Right. So just a basic understanding of the brain in the first chapter and addressing one of the more common myths and understanding why it's a myth based on how our brain is designed to actually operate. Then we move into the next section is awareness, which I touch largely on mindfulness. And the reason mindfulness is really mindfulness is just another way of saying awareness, but it's a very specific type of awareness that is proactive. It is more accepting and flexible with our own thoughts and feelings. And it's more grounded, meaning that it focuses on what's going on right now. This awareness is invaluable because for our brain, awareness is the first line of information processing. Something could actually be happening, but if you are unaware of it, your brain doesn't do anything with it. And so if we're not training a proactive, grounded and accepting awareness, things are going to go by us faster and we're not going to, we're not going to be ready for them before we need to be ready for them. And also what happens is we start fighting our own thoughts and feelings. And again, if you understand how your brain is designed, fighting thoughts and feelings creates more thoughts and feelings. And if we're trying to streamline our thoughts, being aware of them in a more mindful way allows us to interact with them with a little bit of space between us and them. In psychology, we call this cognitive diffusion, meaning we are not fused to our thoughts and feelings just because they exist. And in that space between us and our thoughts and feelings, we can focus on anything that we want to do for at least short periods of time. So if you're not training awareness in a way that gives you that flexible and durable backbone, your brain is going to work based on how its default settings are going. And then you're at the whip's end of how your brain is designed to respond to stress and and, uh, a trigger rich environment. In which case, then you can tell yourself, relax, just don't think, just be confident, just trust, just commit. And you're literally working against how your brain is designed in the same way that if I told you, you need to hit this ball in the air and you try to hit it, hit up on it when it's a wedge on a tight lie. Good luck. You're probably going to skull it or duff it. Okay. From the, after the awareness section, we move into habits. Cause the bottom line is us as human beings, we are habits. The way our brain is designed is to take habits, both psychological and physical behaviors and put them into automatic mode so that we can go learn and understand and explore new things. But our habits will run based on their default setting unless we intervene with them in a very systematic way. And so if you have built the habit of building confidence off of outcomes, at some point that habit is going to become unproductive even though it was really productive before. Take anxiety, for example. If you are on the low end of the learning curve, which basically means you kind of suck at something, and anxiety is motivating you, you're going to get better. Because you're going to go study more, you're going to go practice more, you're going to go uh, work out harder, et cetera, and you're going to see some improvement. At the top end of the learning curve where the margins between success and failure are smaller, not only is anxiety going to make it more difficult for you to perform freely, particularly under pressure, it's also going to make the experience not enjoyable and you're not going to have the outcomes coming at, at a way that can counterbalance that. And ultimately what it's going to do is it's going to lead to a level of burnout to some degree or another. So if you do not address that habit at its source, it's going to keep running because the way our brain is designed is to keep it running unless you show it, one, it ain't working, and two, here's a better option for you. And then from habits, we then move into our psychological framework, which psychological framework is a fancy way of saying how you see yourself, how you see the world around you and yourself interacting with it, including our golf game. And this is important because our psychological framework is for running the show. Our core beliefs and assumptions, the thoughts we have about things, determine what value and meaning they have to us. 
And so if you have the thought, I must be perfect, otherwise this whole thing is a waste of time, it's going to trigger a series of avoidance-based habits, frustration, anxiety, avoidance, etc. And based on how your brain is designed, it's going to perceive any situation where imperfection is part of the formula as something that is threatening and worth being worth avoiding. And as you get into situations where perfection doesn't exist, nor is it required, it's going to make performing in that way, very difficult. It's also going to make getting better over a long period of time, much more difficult because you're going to start, usually you start coupling things like your identity and your self-worth and your level of motivation. And uh, you're going to create a very transactional relationship with your craft, which is not super fulfilling. And so the book is ordered in a way that they build upon each other sequentially. So you understand like, okay, here's how my brain works. Here's the awareness to develop that allows me to then address my behaviors and address the core beliefs and assumptions and perceptions I have that are keeping me from being present when I really want to be present. And all of those, I mean, I, when I was looking through the book, I'm like, okay, habits, that's going to have a profound impact on your golf game, but they all do. Um, especially if you, you follow the order that you've, you've laid out here. Uh, to improve your game. There's a term that I came across multiple times in the book that I'd really love a further explanation about because I wasn't quite, because I, I wasn't familiar with the term uh -huh. in all my reading, and that's mode of mind. Mode can of mind. Can we talk about that? Yeah. Sure. If we're talking about mindfulness, we can think about how we interact with our own thoughts and feelings through two different modes of mind. You might just think of them as two different modalities, two different options, two different types of relationship is really what you're talking about. So mm -hmm. one is a doing mode of mind. Doing is like a problem solving approach. You know, for example, let's say I have the thought, uh oh, don't hit it left. The doing mode of mind approach would be uh, just stuff that thought away. Don't think about it, banish it or pretend it doesn't exist, sweep it under the rug. So I'm trying to problem solve this thought. Conversely, a being mode of mind would be one where we can have that thought and it just be a thought. It's not a fact. It's not a precursor of a future outcome or anything of that nature. Essentially, like it's just a thought, period, end of sentence, nothing more. And what happens is we stop wrestling with our thoughts in a being mode of mind. We start wrestling with our feelings. So mode of mind might just be uh, another way of saying like how we interact or we relate to our own thoughts and feelings. And to be clear, one is not good and one is not bad. A doing mode of mind is super helpful for us with external problem solving. You know, if you're going to do math homework, trying to solve a math problem through a doing mode of mind would be super helpful. Our inner experience, meaning our thoughts and feelings, is not. It's not a, a formula that needs to be solved. Our, des our body and brain is designed to create sensations, feelings, and thoughts. They're not a vending machine that needs to be serviced just because they feel scratchy or they're quote unquote negative or disruptive. If we learn to interact with our thoughts and feelings in a way where we can have them and they can just be a thing without having to be anything more, then you don't have to worry about having quote unquote negative thoughts. Because if you do, it's just like any other passing sensation, a sight, a sound, a smell that can come and go. And things that come and go for us become less disruptive to our performance, less disruptive to our lives. And the bottom line is if you're fighting your own thoughts and feelings, um, you're never going to win that fight. It's kind of like the Hydra, like you chop off one and two heads just keep coming up. And many people can relate to this because they're trying to um, meet their thoughts and feelings with resistance rather than uh, allowing them to coexist. Yeah. We frequently, my wife and I all frequently talk about, especially when it comes to mindfulness, how we've always been a uh, human doing as opposed to a human being. Yeah, yeah, the human doing is kind of this idea that like I need to do extraordinary things to be an extraordinary person. And again, it's not right or wrong, good or bad, but what often happens with that is we create a transactional relationship with the world around us where we have to meet some certain threshold of success or rate of success in order to feel that we are doing enough to be enough. Um, and oftentimes I think we get that order of operations backwards sometimes where it's actually better to be a human being and allow for the doing and the performing to flow from there because not only does it create more space for us to be able to do that but the bottom line is that transactional relationship i have to do this in order to be this it 
it doesn't work. It runs out. We build a tolerance to success and it doesn't matter how much money, how many trophies, whatever, after a certain point, it cannot keep pace. And again, that is based on how our brain is designed to interact with extrinsic motivators. In our current world, it's trophies and money and status. In our previous iterations of our brains, it was food, resources, et cetera. And our brain is specifically designed to say enough is enough so that we don't overconsume. But we live in a world of abundance now, not a world of scarcity. Hmm. So I want to make a recommendation to the audience. Um, if you love this kind of content, then you definitely need to pick up this book. If you think that this is all um, fooey, if this is the stuff that you don't necessarily put into your game, then you have to read this book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't miss out on this opportunity. Yeah. Again, it's called Golf Beneath the Surface, The New Science of Golf Psychology by Raymond Pryor. Yeah. Raymond, thank this has been fascinating. I appreciate it. And yeah, thank you. And I'll just, I'll just finish with one thought. The book Please. might be a little bit more difficult. The book might be a little bit more difficult to read than what's currently available. That's a good thing. Like we don't get better and we don't understand things more deeply without challenging the stuff that we already know and trying to build more knowledge and more understanding and a more comprehensive knowledge of something. So what I'll say is if the book's a little bit more than previous, that's a good thing because that's actually the same thing as going to a golf lesson. You go to the same golf lesson over and over and over again, you're not going to get better. You need someone who's going to challenge what you're doing, perhaps provide you some different options that might be a little bit more comprehensive and stretch your limits a little bit. That's what this book is going to do. And I would challenge anyone to read it and not find something of value that can help them be a better golfer and also enjoy golf a little bit. Our dog, you with the doctor on that one, isn't it? You know, I just realized the other day that this part of the podcast, after we finish the interview, is really our 19th hole where I share some stories from my latest rounds, have a refreshing beverage, and recruit more ambassadors like Tony Redden of Cincinnati, Ohio, who opened today's episode. Uh, this Golf Smarter Ambassador program has been far more successful than I ever imagined, so I just really want to thank you all for participating and sharing with our global community where you're from and where you play. As you heard at the opening of today's episode, Tony Redden of Cincinnati, Ohio, plays at Newman Golf Course. And for his effort of leaving a voicemail, he's going to receive Tony Manzoni's video of the Lost Fundamental. You know, you too are eligible to win one of three great prizes just for leaving a voicemail. You can select Tony's video a glove and glove storage compartment from redroostergolf.com, which is a unique glove subscription service that offers many styles of gloves in 26 sizes for men and women. Or you can get a box of X1 balls with the Golf Smarter logo from Odin Golf, the golf brand that sponsors and pays everyday golfers. These tour quality balls are a fraction of the price of what you'll usually pay. And when you use the code GOLFSMARTER at checkout, you'll receive an additional 20% off the order. Their link is in today's show notes. Just send an email and I'll get back to you with some instructions of what to do and what to say, and you're a Golf Smarter Ambassador. Write to golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com or visit golfsmarter.com and click on the Hey Fred button. Now, I played with my friend Neil, whom I'm going to Bandon Dunes with next month. And we played at his club, the Richmond Country Club. And I've played there multiple times with him. And he and I are always so close when we play each other. Even if I have to give him strokes, I only beat him by one or two. This time I beat him by one. But when we did match play, he crushed me. So it's his course. Got to give him that. Anyway, the greens were so fast. I've never played on greens that were this fast or this subtle before. I was very happy with how I was making contact all day, but wow, the greens killed me. I had 41, yes, 41 putts in my round. I generally strive to be in the 30 to 32 putt range, but realistically, I'm generally closer to 34 to 36. Still got to work. But 41? Ouch. I'm going to go out there and try again this weekend, and maybe I'll do a little bit better. I got to focus on that. And tomorrow, I'm getting together with three college buddies to play a fun track designed by Reese Jones in Alameda, California called Corica Park. 
You may have heard of it before if you've been listening a while because we featured that course on Golf Smarter back in 2019 on episode 705. I Actually, going out there, it's an Australian Lynx style course. And that's again, this is all in my preparation to play better when I get out to Bandon Dunes, play Windy, play Lynx, you know, everything I can do. I've been wor- walking a lot, playing a lot, and I'm. <laughs> starting to get nervous of how I'm going to do when I get out to Bandon. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for upcoming episodes, I'd love to hear from you. Just click on the Hey Fred button when you visit golfsmarter.com.